For those of you who are new, my name's Nat, and me and April, who work at Exceptional Individuals, we run these weekly webinars on everything under the sun, from dyspraxia to dyslexia, um, to the science, the history, anything about what minds working differently, the pros, the cons, the in-betweens. And we try to keep these as interactive and lighthearted as possible, but we get real big ass chunky academic um, sources and we make them really digestible so everyone can benefit and learn from them because literally they're not the easiest to read. It is a neurodivergent, but I think it's because we don't hear about it that often. It's a lot rarer. 4% of the population ha- are apparently synesthetic. That's a lot. 4% is a big amount. But the reason no one talks about it is because no one knows they have it. It's only if you were to have a conversation like we're having today when you might be like, huh, eh, maybe I do. So today, my goal isn't for all of you to run off and diagnose yourself. And um, this is a really interesting one. I was kind of unsure to do this one or not because I knew there'd be less people potentially interested, but I do think those who are interested, it will mean quite a lot because it's not that easy to find things online around this. So am I sinis... I I really struggle to pronounce this word. (laughs) Thesis. This does it. Can anyone help me with pronouncing that? Synesthete. Synesthete. Yes. Thanks, doll. Synesthete is the correct term rather than synesthetic. However, that word makes more sense because you've got dyslexic, dyspraxic, or autistic. Um, but this is word for someone who is diagnosed or self-diagnosed with having synesthesia. And I think this image here is quite a good one to demonstrate give you a flavor <laughs> the pun what we mean it's when you 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 have like you know your senses like when you lick something you taste it when you see something you visualize it but synesthesia is when you get those senses mixed up you could see something and taste it could hear something and feel it it's when those senses like the wires get mixed up and it, what's really interesting about it is it's so different and unique for every single individual. I think they found about 80 different varieties of synesthesia to date. And this could, you know, it could be a mix and match. And even more interestingly, it runs in the family. But say if your mum has it and she, when she sees carrots, she thinks of a cold blue, you might think of like, a hot uh, red like it does the, the way it affects you doesn't run through families and uh what have we got uh Sanjay you mentioned that your partner wasn't sure if it's neurodivergent or not I would say it definitely is but if it's a disorder or not that's a whole different question because there really aren't as many perceived disadvantages to having synesthesia though there are some and those are things that we are going to talk about today and with with the pros and cons. So a quick one, if you're new to us, we're a neurodivergent organization. We do recruitment. So if you're looking for a new job, get in contact, training, consultancy, audits, essentially your A to Z of supporting people with A to Zs, everything under the sun. So Sanjan says, my partner sees it as ability, not a disability. disability." And yeah, I've I've been kind of playing with that idea a lot lately disability and ability and I realize some people say they have a disability but they are not disabled and I think that's an interesting way of looking at it because I recognize that my dyslexia um, is a disability but does it disable me maybe not so those words don't always have to be like interlinked but as we already mentioned for those of you who missed our previous ones or want to catch up on today we always upload them to YouTube. So our last one we did was on the comorbidity of neurodiversity. All that means is if you have one thing, you're very likely to have another thing. They kind of always go together. And this make, this follows so nicely with synesthesia because normally it's something extra. Not many people just have synesthesia. They'll normally have synesthesia and dyslexia, autism. They normally go together. And we've got a thing from Katie says, we are disabled by societal structures, attitudes and our environment. Absolutely. 
I like to think at least in an ideal world when these stigmas and societal structures were not in place, it wouldn't be disabling. So a quick warning, um, want to cover myself from the law. Uh, today, we aim to indicate if you show characteristics of synesthesia. This is not a diagnostic because ultimately we will all see ourselves in something else. If you've ever read a horoscope and you're like, that sounds just like me. This is exactly like that. For years, I thought I had a different, um, uh, what is it like, star sign. Uh, and I was like, I'm 100% that. And then I found out it wasn't mine. And then I realized it was all fake. <laughs> so this is the same kind of concept. When you do it, you'll be like, you're like, yep, that's me, that's me. But correlation doesn't equal causation. What that means is just because something looks like it might fit doesn't mean it necessarily does. So use this as like a starting point for a conversation rather than like pure fact though I have backed up everything we've done today with references, we're still not clinical professionals. Also, if any of you do struggle with flashing imagery, today's probably not the best one for you, to be honest with you, because we use a lot of flashing colors to try to create a sense of empathy um, of what it could be like for certain people with synesthesia. So in a nutshell, what is synesthesia? Well, basically it's when you hear music, but you see shapes or you hear a word or a name and instantly see a color. Synesthesia is a fancy name for when you experience one of your senses through another. And when we think of synesthesia, everyone always thinks of like seeing color and like tripping. Not necessarily. This could be essentially when you, any sense which is experienced through another sense. So it could be a really boring one, like just smell, like you can smell the color red. Um, it doesn't have to be colors. Um, it's just experiences different senses. And if you think about it, autism is often hypersensitivity or undersensitivity. And you can kind of see how those two relate. This is just taking it kind of like one step further. So, the, you know, it's not uncommon to have autism and synesthesia. So the first question, I just to uh, wet your whistles. I want to ask you, what is your favorite musician out of this bunch? We've got Pharrell Williams, uh, we've got Billie Eilish, Billy Joel, or Kanye West. If you hate all of them, I'm sorry. I had to pick the, the, uh, the most popular ones. And I think Kanye West is just called Ye, Ye now, isn't he? Like, branding, mate, he doesn't care. So all of these lovely people report to having synesthesia. And a lot yeah. of your favorite artists and musicians of all time do have synesthesia because it's actually a really big advantage um, to certain professions. You might think being creative means, you know, you'd be so great. But actually, a lot of really, really successful mathematicians and scientists have synesthesia because not only does it allow you to see kind of color in some instances, it also allows you to have an additional way to remember things. So like if you're saying like, okay, one times two, you know, that you have to remember that. But if you remember like one is a different color and then when you add those colors, you get a different color. It's essentially just an extra way to help memory. There was one person of like years back who had synesthesia who was given five hours and he remembered like, I want to say 20 or 50,000 different individual characters of pie just because he was able to like remember him in different colors. Ridiculous, but amazing. Oh, nice. Everyone's a Pharrell lover. I mean, he is a lovable chap, isn't he? Kanye West, bless him. He's, he's a jerk. Great music, but a jerk. I hope he doesn't watch this. Uh, so a truth or a lie. I just want you to ask yourself, do you think these are true or false? And this is to get a rough idea of where you are in your understanding. So the first one is most with people who are synesthesia, are born with it and it runs in the family. So in other words, is it hereditary? <laughs> okay, you like Kanye. I honestly like his music a lot. Um, I don't know if I'd vote for him to be president, but anyway, left-handed people and women are more likely to have it. So are you more likely if you're female left-handed? And lastly, when sick, their abilities stay the same. So interestingly, well, actually, not surprisingly, I should say, 
it, 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 it's your lifelong. Like all neurodivergences, apart from acquired, but that's a discussion for another day. You are born with being synesthesia, synesthetic, you die with it. And interestingly, as um, it doesn't seem to change. So you could be 90 and still have it just as strong as you've had it your whole life. Where those with autism and dyslexia can mask, which means you can kind of like fake it almost or kind of get by, people with synesthesia, it's not something they personally can switch on and off. That being said, though, you can have it change depending on if you are unwell. Because you know, that, again, really does make a lot of sense. You have a cold you're not able to hear as well. You can't speak as well. You've got pollen in your eyes. Your eyes are itchy. You can't always feel when you're like got the flu. So if synesthesia is just experiencing sense in a different way, stands to reason that if you're unwell, you might not see colors or music or textures in the same way that you normally experience them. So yeah, though it is for life, it can vary depending on how you feel. I read that first one as it ruins families. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it very well may do, but uh, oh well. No, it might also save them. And also left-handed people are more likely to have it. And females, why? We truly do not know. Katie says, I think I can feel other people's feelings. That is an interesting one. And whether or not that's part of this, who knows? But one thing that has been shown is that those who have autism actually have higher levels of empathy than the general population, which is something which people normally think the opposite is true. So very interesting. But now we've done, you know, a bit of a fun facts. We're going to get into looking at the criteria or some of the characteristics of being synesthetic. And all I want you to do is ask yourself, how does this apply to you? If you want to, you can answer it on the behalf of someone else. But what I would like to say is, in order to get diagnosed with anything, right, there's a list of like characteristics people look for. That saying, you do not need to get 10 out of 10 in order to get diagnosed. You might only have a couple of characteristics or only one or two, and yet that will be enough to get you diagnosed. Um, so do not think, you know, if you're like, oh, I, I have all of these, that doesn't necessarily mean you are. And if you have none of them, that doesn't necessarily mean you are not. That being said, again, not many people would actually get diagnosed for synesthesia. It will typically be for autism, dyslexia, something else. Is it connected with psychic ability? I don't know. That's going down a whole minefield there. I'm, I'm going to say probably not, but I'm not ruling it out. So the first question I want to ask you is, do you perceive numbers, letters or words in colour? So what do we mean? Like, say if you were to like be like reading, do you get kind of like a colour or a tint? Sometimes it can be like a halo. Try not to think of it as like overly obvious. You know, sometimes it can be quite like mild. But again, be honest, because... <laughs> And I think, you know, in some ways we kind of always, we're always going to like to some extent, but most people, well, who have like some parts of synesthesia will actually see it. From what I've uh, been told, it's like a word might seem hot or cold, or there might be um, almost like a highlightedness to it. This is a, uh, a really bad analogy, but I've been watching a lot of Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney lately. And they've got like force ghosts. And uh, basically, the more stronger the force is, the more you can see the ghosts. And the weaker the force, the more faint they are. And that's similar to synesthesia. Depending on like mood, um, surroundings, where you are in life, you might see the colours more vividly or more faintly. I'll try and keep my nerdy references out of bay, but that's one way I've been looking at it. So the next one is, do certain sounds produce an odour or a taste in your mouth? People have um, described seeing like the word A, like a charcoal smell, or like you might see a word smelling a bit like petrol. Uh, one person really famously 
Um, whenever he heard his girlfriend's name, he would smell broccoli. I'm guessing he liked broccoli. Another interesting thing, someone who has their name spelled, like, I can't remember, like, let's say, for example, Ellie, you could spell it with an I on the end or with a Y on the end. Someone who had synesthesia, it described how different ways of spelling a name had different smells and tastes. So how, why, we don't really know. And though it is different for everyone, certain like O, for example, people would often see as white or transparent. A would often be red. So there are similarities between like a big sample size, but honestly, we're not really sure. Okay, oh, it's a bit more balanced on this. Do you feel physical sensations when watching someone else get hurt? Actually, this probably goes back into, Katie, what you were saying. Um, can you feel other people's feelings? So say if you watch someone get hurt, obviously the, the nicest, the nice people in us would be like, oh, I feel sorry for them. But I'm not on about feeling sorry. I'm on about, does it actually hurt you? Yeah, far as that yeah, can, I, can I say something now? Yeah. I, I think this is like when someone's having an operation on, on a, and you, you see these documentaries on TV, um, they're, having that, uh, they're having a physical operation in there and the doctor's performing on them. And I can't watch, it's like I feel the pain for them and, and I can't see it happening. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like, yeah. Yeah, it's like so someone's having their um, uh, stage, open surgery or something. And the doctors are actually showing you on TV the open surgery being done at this moment in time and the tools they're using and the blood coming out. And, and, and I, start, I, feel, I start to cringe and I start to actually curl up and I, start, I can't do it, I can't watch it. That's really interesting. And I don't know if anyone else has felt that. I love horror movies, but I cannot watch those ER programs where you see people getting operated on. I just like... It's almost like I'm the one being operated on. Whether that just means I'm really squeamish or it's related to this, who knows? But as I said at the beginning, those with autism, for example, have been seen to have higher levels of empathy. This is another variation of empathy, but one step further. I feel sorry for this girl falling down the stairs. I've played it about like 20 times now and uh, it hurts every time. So <laughs> let's move on. And a quick thing I've got here is, okay, next one is, do you perceive colours or abstract shapes during everyday activities like eating? So this is like, again, maybe you're eating broccoli this time and you see shapes or colours, or maybe you smell a burger and you get this kind of glow. You know smells provoke feelings. Like if any of you seen Ratatouille, when this kind of like the evil reviewer like eats the ratatouille dish, he goes back to his childhood because it provokes a memory. But with some types of synesthesia, that smell doesn't provoke a feeling or a memory, it provokes a color or a shape. Really interesting. And I know synesthesia sounds a bit like odd for those who don't experience it, but you try telling someone what it likes to feel or to smell something to someone who has never been able to do that. That would also sound a little bit odd. Oh, nice. We've got a uh, all round here. Sanjan says, I am a sick partner, sometimes uh, sympathetic pain or symptoms. Yep. Yeah. Laho says, I get what you mean, Katie. Feel it's environmental and sensitivity for me. Wonder what it is for you. It's emotional pain I can feel, not physical. No, that's cool. There is an interesting thing when it comes to synesthesia about whether or not it is all physical or mental. And it can be both or one or the other. So yeah. for example, some people will, uh, if they see a letter, they will physically see color. For others, when they picture a letter in their head, they'll see color, but they might not see it on both. So it can also be an internal thing as well. Even more difficult to diagnose though. The next one is saying, do you describe your unusual perceptions to other people? So if you experience something like what we've mentioned, would you tell someone or would you keep it to yourself? And this is really relevant because as I said, the vast majority of people who 
do have synesthesia do not know they have it because it's essentially it's what you take for granted you just expect everyone else sees the way that the world that you see or experience it so why would you ever mention it to anyone and this is one of the things having these conversations are really important because there's nothing i mean some people might but for most people there's not many negatives uh, so why would you ever bother telling your doctor or a friend but talking to people might help as well so actually you'd think if you tell people all the time it might be a bigger sign but actually it tends to be those who do not speak about it are i'm not know about more likely but do tend to be to have synesthesia when they eventually get found sanjan says i think my partner doesn't mention it because people would think he's weird and i could imagine that's true when I try to explain to people that I have hypersensitivity, all they think is uh, you're being a bit of a wuss. And it's not true. Like, I genuinely, I don't know how to describe it, but I feel the world more intense than others. Like, certain textures will really irritate me, or if I'm really calming and soothing, certain sounds will be, like, so high-pitched that I just kind of curl up like a slug, and others will be smooth, and I'll just, like, fall asleep instantly. And... It, I don't think well, I have a synesthesia. I think it's just part of my ASD. But it is something which is hard to explain to those who do not experience it. Katie says, I say out loud what I see. I hit the nail on the head without even realizing it. People react quite badly. That's, again, a really common trait um, for ASD as well. And Dal says, it's very hard to put into words these sensations. Absolutely. No one talks yeah. about it. Matt, could I add something to what you just yeah, said? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Actually, I want to say the name correctly. Is it Dal? Hi. You said something earlier about the first question that ruins families. I think it's been difficult because I think everyone in my family kind of has something. And we're all different personalities. But I think whatever culture you come from, there's always a stigma. And that can make it you either assimilate with your symptoms or you don't. You like basically struggle for the rest of your life or you don't. And something someone said about the physical, there was another thing. I think it, there is a difference because for me, in the area I've grown up and my identity, I've experienced a lot of violence. So there's one or two things that happen when I see violence, even though I react that same way. I, even though I feel it a lot, it's basically because I'm hypersensitive. I would either be like, oh, like, can I help? Or, I don't know what to do here. This is too much. <laughs> because that's my identity on a day-to-day. -day. Like, I experience violence in different ways. It doesn't always have to be physical. But I think most of it is mental. That's really interesting. Well, thanks for sharing that. And honestly, it affects everyone so differently. Oh, and sorry. Oh, yeah. And when you can't articulate yourself, it makes it worse. <laughs> I think it makes it worse because no one believes that there's a problem you put That's your foot in it a lot don't you and you sound a bit uh, like everyone always assumes it's mental health it not, doesn't have to be again if, so if, if, if the whole world did not smell and you were the only person who could smell things would people say that you have a mental health condition maybe they'll say it's all in your head it's not real uh, I mean, if we're getting really down the rabbit hole, nothing is real. Sight isn't real. It's our brain's interpretation of the way that light hits our retina and is processed. Nothing is real. But before we all have like an existential crisis, I'll move on to the next one. So for this one, does hearing music produce an experience of colour for you? So let's say you're listening to some Mozart and it's blaring out. Maybe you're listening to Kanye and you're just in the moment. If you're listening to Eminem rapping about putting squirrels up people's bums or whatever he talks about these days, like, do you feel red? I know, doll, but he does rap about weird stuff. Like Taylor Swift, maybe you think of this like light pink colour. I'd love to know what type of music provokes a colour to you. So we've got Faintly, yes. It's a no for me. Okay, no, I mean, I think this is a particularly interesting one and I can kind of see it. 
you, when people go to discos, they like to see colour for like mood and festivals. You know, it, it does provoke an emotion. A lot of famous artists, um, like, uh, was it Beethoven or was it um, who was blind? Who, or no, was it Mozart who went blind? Well, I'm pretty sure it was Mozart, Beethoven. It was one of the two. Correct me if any of you know that. But like kind of lost their vision and was able to come up with music. And they said they could kind of see it in their head, which I thought was really interesting. So following on is I see numbers, days, etc., in a spatial landscape or patterns around my body. Now, this one might seem really, really bizarre to those who don't experience it. We're not thinking of like walking letters, but when you're like thinking of the time, you might visualize it in front of you. Or like when you're adding up, rather than kind of being like an internal number line, it's kind of, if any of you have ever um, put like those like VR glasses on where you can kind of like touch things, but you can't really touch them. I imagine it might feel similar to that. Some of these though are quite rare. So I am not surprised that the vast majority of you will not have any experience in this. One, as always, synesthesia, there's over 80 varieties of it. So not having any of these doesn't mean anything. I, I don't, getting people to think they have something when they don't have it is bad enough, but getting someone to think they do not have it when they do is equally as bad. Um, so please do keep all of this in mind, that these are just some of the ways that it affects certain people. Katie says that she feels the music. And I think music is created in order to provoke an emotion from us. It just, like with most things in life, it is a spectrum on how that affects you. There's been like really interesting studies on individuals who um, absolutely loved music, but then when they had like um, some sort of brain injury, their love of music completely disappeared and they got like really depressed as a result. Uh, so all these emotions are really connected. And we learn a lot from people, from people who didn't have something to then do have something. But with a lot of neurodivergences, it is lifelong. So it's very difficult to study something if that is the way that someone has always been. Uh, so it is important to study individuals who have lifelong neurodivergence and also acquired neurodivergence. So if anyone says to you, oh, you can't get dyslexia through being uh, hit on the head, you kind of can, but just know that it's rare, like a small amount of people, the vast majority born with. Sanjan says, I met someone who has this experience. I uh, I never want to underapply, like we actually get quite a few people attend these webinars who due to like some sort of life traumatic event now has all the characteristics of someone with dyslexia. And actually, a lot of the ways you support them is the exact same way you'd support someone who was born with it. Interesting, but they are still different and separate conditions. Moving on nicely, we've got, I have been affected by visual distractions. So if you kind of like, I think a good way to explain this is like sounds causes color that blocks your view of the screen or a board of information on. So maybe you're looking at the TV and like color will kind of glaze over it or it'll be like a streak. I'd imagine it'd be like, you know, when you like the sun glares on something and you can't see it, but you get that kind of glare when there's no light around. So it's like an internal glare. You got sometimes, no, yes. I sometimes get like a yellowy tint, but I, I'm not sure. Sometimes I blink and it goes away. That's probably something else. But I imagine a lot of you are like, this is so kind of, it's hard to put yourself in that position without experiencing it. Yeah, feel uh, free. Yeah, go for it. Sound. Sound is like, I think sound is the first one. Like my, I think some of my traits are more to do with environment. So I'll need structure, you move something out of place, I move it back. <laughs> um, but that's what I'll be thinking in my head, but I, I'm very uh, introverted. So it just looks like everything's fine. But um, 
sound is sound is disorientating sometimes, like like a high pitch or very loud stuff. But I'll still go to the carnival, you know. <laughs> but it's a bit. I think it's when I'm in control of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the sensitivity is a really big thing. I know. Um, for me, I'm really annoying to watch TV or a film with because let like the volume might be consistent, but in my ears, it goes up and down. So like some people, they think I'm deaf. They're like, how can you not hear that? Or they'll turn yeah. it up really loud. And I'm like, ah. Is it because you don't want to miss anything? No, it, it's just that the sound doesn't stay consistent. So let's say the volume is like a five. Some days I cannot hear it at all. And other days it's so loud that it kind of causes me pain. It like I, my body regulates it very different. Like being overstimulated. Yeah. Um, and again, very commonly um, associated with autism. But with all these things, it is a big, big spectrum. And the only reason we tend to be, give people diagnosis is because it allows people a kind of a template on how to best support someone. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, a great way to prove that is to look at the fact that we have so many different names for things. And over the years, they change. We always look for the best kind of label or title that can help give us meaning. Imagine if, you know, synesthesia is a difficult thing to explain to those who have never heard of it. But imagine explaining it to someone without that word. It would be almost impossible. So it kind of validates someone's experience and say, you know, it matters. Oh, we got to avoid much color or visual thinking around. My desk or place I need to concentrate. Yes, some people will purposely avoid color in order to help them to concentrate because for them it is a distraction where others will require it in order to have that creativity. So next one I want to ask you is, I am affected by visual confusion. So what do I mean by that? I mean, I confuse numbers and colors when doing sums or other calculations. So this could be, like reading uh, like maths, you know, like one plus one, but your brain interprets a one as a seven. Now you can see how this one relates to dyslexia, but where dyslexia is like, you know, seeing it and how it interprets it in the brain, this could be to do due to the color or the shape. Some of you might have heard of things like the dyslexia font. And the way that the dyslexia font works is that the letters are weighted at the bottom. So every single letter is unique to its own and the brain is able to interpret it easily enough. But when you have like, you know, an I and an L or things that look very similar or a seven or a one, certain people might find it harder to dif differentiate, um, like to spot the difference. And this is another com common occurrence with synesthesia. So already today, we've seen how it relates to a lot of the characteristics that are common with autism and a lot of characteristics that are common with dyslexia. So it stands to reason why if you have one, it's not that you are going to have something else, but you're more likely to have that something else in the general population. So this one, and you're doing all great, by the way, I have difficulty in the work environment. So this one is a bit more on the ground. Do you find work particularly difficult? Now, of course, most of you are going to say yes, but let's give it a bit more context. So you see information with wrong colors. Think about this like similar to having like color blindness. Maybe when you see like the fire, the, the exit, which says fire, you know, that's green, you might see a blue. Or maybe when you're on Excel and you've got those little color tabs, the colors aren't quite the same. Or maybe someone's in the kitchen cooking up a tree, a microwave meal, and it smells so repulsive to you that it completely distracts you and you cannot work. This is another kind of sign that synesthesia is something you might want to look into or get diagnosed because when we look, we said about, didn't we, like 4% of the population um, is believed to have synesthesia. That does not mean 4% are diagnosed. Hardly any people are. You only ever get diagnosed by a clinical professional if it is something which is interfering or inhibiting your day-to-day -day life or activities. So let's say you have dyslexia, but it's mild, doesn't even bother you. You're not going to get diagnosed. You know, what's the point? And the same with synesthesia, because it isn't treated like a disorder, like other neurodivergences, no one is that bothered. So they're not going to get kind of treated for it. 
Uh, so it's kind of interesting and worth knowing that if you believe you're experiencing any of the things I'm saying today, this isn't for you to like ring the alarm bells and go off to a doctor and say, I need help. No, it just be you. It doesn't really matter. But if you're experiencing it and there are perceived negative consequences and it, you feel that it's limiting you from being your best self, that's when you might want to go and seek further support. It also could be like underlying factors. So though, for instance, color blindness and synesthesia might seem quite similar, they're very, very different. One is the absence of color and the other one is kind of like the addition of color. But again, one, um, they're, they're both in terms of how the brain processes it. So this one is, I experience pain when witnessing others in distress. You think, but Nat, didn't we already answer this one? Well, the last one was seeing physical pain. This one is experiencing internal pain. So if you see someone is depressed or sad or anxious, not just like they stubbed their toe. And those with synesthesia might experience these motions like so much more severe. I'd, I've met a few, I know a few people with synesthesia and like, if I'm feeling a bit low, they all get like really intense. Or like, you're okay. You know, everything's okay. Oh my God, you're really making me down. Like they'll, it's almost like they're experiencing the pain on behalf of me. And I'm like, I'm actually okay. But they'll go that like one step further and it might not seem proportionate. Yeah. See, some of you have experienced that. This one kind of relates a little bit to obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, but again, is a bit different. Because I have repetitive behaviors, such as fixing repetitive routines or an urge to check things repeatedly. And you might be like, nah, what does this have to do with synesthesia? It's not about color, sound, or shapes, or touch. Well, it, there is a correlation. A lot of people with synesthesia do struggle with OCD tendencies. That's not to say they have a separate diagnosis of OCD, but they do kind of get very fixed on objects. So yes, the fact of being able to experience things more intensely might not inherently be a disability or a disadvantage, but something like OCD could be kind of born from synesthesia, but the OCD is what actually affects you most. Another way of looking at this is that autism isn't, really it doesn't have to be debilitating but the hypersensitivity that comes with autism is the thing that can be debilitating so a lot of the time it isn't the actual condition which is the bad thing it's the things that come along with it for the ride laho says it makes me run as they are overstimulating me oh i can see that <laughs> okay so this one is do you see colored colored auras around people. This sounds super supernatural. Not at all. I don't know. Have any of you ever had laser eye surgery? One of the common um, side effects or like potential things that happen of it is that people see auras around their eyes. This is a lot similar, but for a different reason. Um, imagine every time you go into a church, and you've seen a picture of like baby Jesus with a glow around the face. I'd imagine it's quite similar to that. Yeah around and around things brilliant oh i can relate with this one depends on the color yeah and the color really changes to all different people i wish i could give you an explanation about why this is a thing honestly we do not know synesthesia isn't well researched um it's something which we understand the characteristics to it but understanding the reasoning behind it is so difficult it's because you said there's 80 different varieties of it if you do research on one person, that one person doesn't really represent everyone else. And as such, getting funding for something like this, which is so niche and specialized, is very difficult. But it's interesting to see that some of you do experience this. <laughs> I like this little gif of the unicorn. So do you taste explicit colors or textures? Do you like if say if you taste salty popcorn, do you get this like rough feeling or like a blue? It's not with all things, but it is really interesting. Almost like you're eating the rainbow. It, it feels like a Skittles advert when I say taste the rainbow, but you actually are tasting the rainbow. 
Nice. We've got spe spe uh, specifically in things which have a high color frequency. Nice. Do you have a strong interest in visual arts or music? What's your favorite? So if you had a pick, would you be a painter, a drawer, a printmaker, a sculptor, a ceramica, or a photographer? And again, why is this relevant? Because a lot of people who do have synesthesia do naturally gravitate to, uh, towards a creative field. I thought that maybe someone we know do, and they own a arts, um, uh, like, kind of arts workshop or cafe, it's really not uncommon for people in those sort of sectors to be part of it. But as I did mention, do not think that if you have synesthesia, you naturally have to be creative. Some people just are not creative. They might have an advantage if they are creative, but you can also be into science or maths or data and numbers because there is a real strong connection between memory it was really cool because a lot of people who are neurodivergent, one of the primary deficits of being neurodivergent is poor memory. But those um, with synesthesia actually have an enhanced memory. Same with autism, actually. But the memory isn't like all round good. It's like certain types of memory. I don't know if it's related, but like I've been autistic all my life and drawing was like my first modality of choice. And I had a really stressful time with it because I was always trying to be hyper realistic in what I do. But it wasn't until I started getting into the abstract painting and playing around with colors and textures that it just feels easy. And like, yeah, I feel like unlocking a valve in my brain kind of when I do that. I think it's, a, it's because like with the people who are neurodivergent, you're living in your own world, which other people can't experience in, and it can be quite isolating. So being able to express it in another form can be quite liberating because it shows others how your mind works. Like if I just showed a flat image, it doesn't really tell you what I see, but if it's got feelings and textures, it really interesting. Mm. Oh, yes, Matt's mentioned. It wasn't um, Helen from the Hearts Club. It was this um, person called Rosie Jenner who had synesthesia. And she has this really great art exhibition we went to. Highly recommend checking out the link. So speaking of art, because, Dull, you were right on the money there, a lot of famous artists were presumably um, hypersynesthetic. Now, why do I say supposedly? Because obviously the, the term is relatively new. So you only can go by on hunch theory and what they have written. But people like Vincent van Gogh did say um, that he sees it in his head and he's able to color it. And whether or not he had it or not, personally, I think he did, but we could never really say for certain. His images really encapsulate what we mean. Like if you take his pictures, the sky and the colors, it isn't just showing you a thing, it's showing you a feeling. And you get that his paint, when he went through his blue period where all his paintings were kind of blue, he was showing you his emotions, not just his facial expressions. And that's what synesthesia is. It's another way of showing the world. And because you can't just tell someone and they understand, if you can demonstrate it in an artistic way, like Van Gogh, then go for it. We can never purpose, we can never really show an accurate representation of what it's like to be neurodiverse or have a mental health condition, but we can go, we can damn well try. And I think that's what we do at Exceptional Individuals. We give it a damn good go to show other people who are neurotypical what it can be like in order for them to be a bit more mind, mindful. And with Van Gogh as a particular example, it's no secret to know that he had severe mental health challenges. And with most neurodivergences, being having mental health challenges isn't inherently part of it. But living in a world which doesn't understand you is going to wear you down. And the likelihood of having mental health challenges go up significantly. It's why attending sessions like this where you talk about it, unwind, you know, uh, meet other people is so important. Because say if Van Gogh had someone he could talk about and not feel stigmatized, maybe he wouldn't have to be that tortured artist and maybe he could have made a lot more art for us.
uh, maybe that's just a one four. So the last question oh, um, is quick true for a lie. Are there over 80 kinds of it? Next, you can't teach yourself to be synesthetic or ideasthesia is another name for synesthesia. So these are really interesting ones. By now, I'm glad that all of you said 80 because I have mentioned that numerous times. There's many ways of looking at synesthesia. On this one, you can't teach yourself synesthesia. Interestingly, you can, but it's not the same. So people with synesthesia can really focus on it. Like in your mind, if you connect the color blue to a, like a leathery texture, over time, you will build up that kind of recognition. It's not the same. So you definitely can build up synesthetic like qualities, but it's not really the same. But just, you know, so you kind of can teach yourself it, though it is a bit, it's different how the brain gets to it, but you can teach it. And the last one, ideasthesia is another name for synesthesia. Yes and no. So ideasthesia is kind of a subterm. So you know how I said some people will see a letter and experience a color, for example. Other people will only do it in their head. So they see it, but not physically. So it's more of a mental thing than a physical thing. Not many people use that term, but it's worth kind of mentioning. And just to polish up with a quick summary, is sometimes synesthesia causes associations. So this could be anything. One feeling or emotion or sense triggering another. So seeing something, you're feeling something, you're tasting something, you're smelling something, and this can go in all different ways. Then you've got experts still don't know what causes synesthesia. I would love to do an episode on the science of synesthesia, Maybe I could do, but we don't have any concrete, this is 100% true. Synesthetics might make up to 4% of the population. Really a very high percentage. But the reason no one talks about it is how do you know your perception of reality is different to the next? You don't. We know that it's hereditary. It runs in family. So if your mum and your dad has it, you probably have it. If your child has it, you might have it. Not necessarily, but possibility. People use synesthesia for truly amazing things. It doesn't have to be bad. Some of the best artists, the best coders, the best musicians have had synesthesia. This definitely isn't a thing you should be ashamed of. Of course, there are downsides to seeing the world different from others, but there are amazing benefits as well. And lastly, as I said, most synesthetics are surprised to find out they have synesthesia. If someone says I have synesthesia, but they don't know, maybe they don't, it's normally the people who are completely oblivious to the fact that might experience it the most, um, maybe authentically, because this isn't something which comes and goes, it is a, con a constant in their life. Now, if any of you do have synesthesia and or think you may have it, and you're currently in work and you're like, ah, this is making my life more difficult than it needs to be, you can get in contact with us and we actually do assessments, not to find out whether or not you have it, but to help you in the workplace and we can get you free equipment and training. Definitely worth following up with us if this sounds like, hmm, currently it's only available to the UK, but get in contact anyway and we might be able to point you in the right direction if not. So any last questions, but if any of you have any questions or comments or anything, now's your space. Thanks. That's it. Nice. Good comment. Nice and easy. Well, in that way, I'm going to go. But if you have follow up further questions, do not hesitate to get into contact. I know that our next webinar next week is on a brief history of hidden disabilities. We're going to get into the history of things. So uh, do get involved. And you can just find that on our YouTube channel. You can find it on our Eventbrite, on our main website. And as you can see, if you go on our YouTube channel, like and subscribe. You can see some amazing fun webinar videos that April has very kindly edited for us. And a few more promo things before I uh, leave you on your way is some webinars we've got coming up. We've got the history of disability. We've got the science of ADHD drugs. Really interesting, particularly when you look at it from a US point of view. Dyslexia across cultures. How are people in Zimbabwe, you know, experiencing dyslexia? Do people in Hong Kong understand it to the same way as us? We're going to be looking into that. Autism and sex. 
Is there anything different? If we're looking on a chromosome level from male and female to X and Y, is there actually difference? Yes, there actually is. And we'll go into that. And then we're lastly, we're going to go on to some discrimination. What are some real cases of dyslexia discrimination? When is it someone just being a meanie? And when is it someone crossing the line and breaking the Equality Act? So these are just some of the questions we'd look at. We've got some opportunity groups. If any of you want to stay in touch, go on our Facebook and search for the Exceptional Individuals Opportunity Group. We try to keep people as up to date as we possibly can on that. And we've got a characteristics test. So if any of you like, hmm, am I synesthetic or dyslexic or autistic? Go on our website. It's not going to 100% tell you, but it will start off as a conversation star, which you can always talk to your GP if you think this is something you want to look into further. Please just use this as a starting point. And here are our details. If you want to get in contact, pick up the dog and bone, drop us an email, and we'll contact you then. But thank you everyone so much for attending. And I really hope you uh, got a couple of gems out today. Cool. Bye everyone.